In video 87 of Tensor Calculus, we're going to introduce the Ricci tensor and its close relative, the Einstein tensor. Both of these tensors are derived from the riemann christoffel tensor by means of contraction. We begin with this very simple definition. We take our Riemann tensor and form a contraction between the upper index and the middle index on the bottom, and the result is this object over here known as the Ricci tensor. Now, as always, when we form a contraction, we know that we're going to get a tensor as a result. If we start with a tensor, we'll get a tensor after the contraction, and the resulting tensor is going to have a rank that's two less than the one we started with, and so it is here. We started with a fourth rank tensor, the Riemann tensor, and the Ricci tensor then has only two free indexes, and that makes it a second rank tensor. Now, a logical question would be, why did we choose the middle index on the bottom? Well, let's uh, play around with this a little bit. Suppose we defined a tensor RAB that is the contraction using the first index here. So let's say that this were our definition right here. Well, this expression is the same as uh, S omega lambda times R lambda omega alpha beta. So this is what we'd use just to raise the index. So these two expressions are exactly equivalent. Well, um, let's reverse the order of lambda and omega here. We reverse the order of S omega lambda to S lambda omega, and we'll reverse the order in the Riemann tensor down here. But of course, as we do that, the first two indexes are anti-symmetric, so that introduces a negative sign. Well, now we use this to raise the index. We get this expression, negative r lambda lambda alpha beta. And of course, we could rename lambda to omega, and that means that we're going to get, according to our definition over here, negative r alpha beta. And of course, as always, anything that's equal to its own negative has got to be equal to zero. That's the only way something can be equal to its additive inverse. So that tells us that if we chose to contract the first index here, all we'd get is a zero value, and that's not very useful. Well, what happens if we form the contraction between the upper index and the third one on the bottom? Well, you know that uh, the Riemann tensor is anti-symmetric with respect to these last two indexes. So if we flip these two, we'll insert a negative sign, and what we'll have is the same definition that we started with here. In other words, uh, contracting this way will simply give us the very same components we have here, except they're all going to be negative. So uh, that doesn't give us any new information. So what we can say is this, that forming our contraction between the upper index and the middle index is really the only meaningful way to form a new tensor with contraction from the Riemann tensor. Any other result is either zero or it gives us a redundant result. Okay, well, now let's do this. Let's start with our definition, R alpha beta being equal to this contraction, R omega alpha omega beta. And now let's express it this way. That's going to be equal to S omega lambda r lambda alpha omega beta. Now let's switch some indexes around. We'll switch these two indexes. Of course, that does not change the sign. And then in uh, the Riemann tensor, let's switch this pair of indexes. Remember, we can flip the first two for the second two. So this is equal to r omega beta and lambda alpha. And making that switch, remember that's a symmetric relationship, so it does not change the sign. Therefore, when we uh, again apply this uh, contravariant metric tensor here, it will raise the index, giving us R lambda beta lambda alpha. And that, according to the definition up here, is just our Ricci tensor expressed as R beta alpha. Now, what that tells us, of course, is that this is equal to this.
and that simply means that our Ricci tensor, as we've defined it here, is symmetric with respect to its two indexes. So what we know so far is that the Ricci tensor, as we have defined it here, is the only meaningful way to form a contraction using our Riemann tensor, and the result is a second rank symmetric tensor. Okay, well let's move on now and form the contraction of our Ricci tensor. And the first thing we need to do is to raise the alpha index. So we would multiply through by a contravariant metric tensor and rename the index. And that would simply raise the alpha index to form R alpha beta. And of course, on the right-hand side of our expression here, we'd have to raise the alpha index too. And remember our syntax, that puts it in this position right here. So this will become R omega alpha omega beta. Now let's form the contraction of alpha with beta. This gives us R alpha alpha. And on the right side, it's R omega alpha and omega alpha. This leads then to yet another definition of something we call the Ricci scalar. So all I've done here is to rename the dummy indexes omega and alpha to alpha and beta respectively. Okay, well, uh, what we have is an invariant scalar value, and we know that because that's what we always get when we form a contraction of any second rank tensor. Now, it may seem somewhat confusing that we keep using the letter R for all of these objects, but really there's no ambiguity because if we uh, see R with four indexes, we know we're talking about the Riemann tensor. If we see R with two indexes, we know we're talking about the Ricci tensor. And if we see R with no indexes, we're talking about the Ricci scalar. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, let me bring up an equation that we derived in the previous video. We said the Gaussian curvature, kappa, multiplied by these levi civita symbols will give us the Riemann tensor. Okay, well, let's raise the lambda and omega indexes here. We'll have kappa times epsilon with lambda and omega in the upper position, epsilon alpha beta in the lower position. And of course, you know that uh, these two factors together is just the definition of our delta function. So this is kappa delta lambda omega alpha beta. And on the right-hand side over here, we've got to raise the two indexes of the Riemann tensor. So this is R lambda omega alpha beta. Now let's form the contraction of lambda with alpha and omega with beta. We've got kappa times delta alpha beta alpha beta. And on the right-hand side, it's R alpha beta alpha beta. And of course, this is, according to our definition here, just the Ricci scalar. And what is the value of delta alpha beta alpha beta? Well, our delta function with a double contraction is just two factorial. And that means, of course, that we can uh, divide both sides of this equation by two, and we'll come up with this expression. Kappa is simply equal to one-half of our Ricci scalar value, R. So this is yet another way to find the Gaussian curvature. Just multiply the Ricci scalar by one-half, and we've got our curvature value. All right, well, the next thing I want to do is to derive a very important identity involving the Ricci tensor. We'll start with the second Bianchi identity from video number 84. The first thing I want to do is to rewrite the expression, flipping some of these indexes around. Let's examine what I've done. In this term, I have flipped the two pairs of indexes. So I put this one over here and this pair over here. So the sign doesn't change, it remains positive. 
Now over here I've done the same thing. I've flipped these two in the opposite position, but I've also flipped them this way. And since I've flipped this one and this one, then the term becomes negative, then positive again. And finally over here, all I've done is to flip the order of these two indexes, and that introduces this negative sign. Next, I want to multiply by a couple of factors here. S lambda alpha and S sigma beta. Now these indexes here are also indexes along the bottom, so I'm really forming some contractions here. Now we started with a fifth rank tensor up here, but now I've formed four different contractions simultaneously, so the expression is reduced to a first rank tensor expression. Well, next we need to distribute these factors into the terms inside the parentheses. As we distribute these factors to the first term, this factor right here will raise the alpha index to make it lambda. So what we'll have is S sigma beta times covariant derivative with respect to sigma of R lambda beta lambda omega. This factor disappears because it has the effect of raising the lambda index right here. Okay, so uh, next we'll distribute these factors over here, and as we do it, this time this factor will raise the beta index to a sigma, similar to what happened here. So this time we have a positive S lambda alpha, this one's unaffected, times the covariant derivative with respect to lambda of R sigma alpha, sigma, omega, just like that. Okay, and finally, when we distribute this factor over here, then this term will raise this index to an alpha. So we're left with a negative S sigma beta, this term here is unchanged, times the covariant derivative with respect to omega, of R alpha sigma alpha beta, and all of that is equal to zero. Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll recognize each of these as the definition of our Ricci tensor. You've got this contraction here, you've got this contraction here, and this contraction right here. So we can replace each of these with uh, the Ricci tensor expression. So you can see that this factor is the same as this one, this is the same as this, this is the same as this. I've also switched the order of these indexes here. So um, looking at the final result, you can see that our, our factors that are out front here will serve to raise the corresponding index in each location. So each of these will be raised accordingly. Now we can see very easily that these two terms are equal. For example, we could rename sigma to lambda, and we'd have the same expression here. So we can combine these two terms together. And at the same time, we have a contraction here, which means this is just our Ricci scalar. Next, I'm going to multiply by S beta omega, like this. Okay, now when we distribute this into the expression, this uh, factor is going to raise the omega index over here. So we're going to have 2 times covariant derivative with respect to lambda of R lambda beta, and then minus covariant derivative with respect to omega of R times our factor s beta omega, and all that's equal to zero. Next, I'm going to rename the lambda index, this dummy index, to alpha. I'll rename omega, which is the dummy index here, to alpha. Uh, 
I'll switch the order of these indexes and I'll divide everything by this factor of 2 out here. Alright, so getting all of that done, we're going to wind up with the covariant derivative with respect to alpha, we're doing this rename here, times r alpha beta minus covariant derivative with respect to alpha of 1 half we're dividing through by 2, remember, so 1 half of r times s, and I'm renaming omega to alpha, and I'm switching the indexes, so this will give us s alpha beta, and that's all equal to 0. Well, um, now you can recognize that we have this common operator here for both terms, so we can, in effect, factor this out, giving us the final form that we're looking for here. We'll have the covariant derivative with respect to alpha of r alpha beta minus one half r times s alpha beta and all of this is equal to zero. The expression we've derived here is known as the contracted Bianchi identity. And its significance lies in uh, this operator right over here. This operator is actually a divergence operator. You'll notice this dummy index here, and that contraction is what makes this the divergence. So the expression tells us two things. First of all, the divergence of the Ricci tensor itself is not equal to zero. But if we add this extra term over here, then we get a, an expression whose divergence is equal to zero. We say that we have normalized this tensor so that its divergence is equal to zero. Now that in turn is the motivation for defining yet another tensor that we call the Einstein tensor. Now if we raise both the indexes alpha and beta here across this expression, we're just going to get uh, this term up here. So it's immediately obvious that the divergence of the Einstein tensor is going to be equal to zero. And that's the reason why we define it the way we do. The uh, Einstein tensor carries basically the same curvature information as the Ricci tensor, but it's a tensor whose divergence is equal to zero, unlike the Ricci tensor itself. And with that, let's take a break and review what we've done. The first thing we did was to define the Ricci tensor with the expression you see right here. It's simply the contraction of our Riemann tensor between the upper index and the middle index on the bottom. Now we demonstrated that uh, this is the only meaningful way to form a contraction using our Riemann tensor. If we contracted these two indexes, we're simply going to get zero. If we contract these two indexes, we'll get the same values for our components over here, except they'll all be negative. Now I've written it down this way to emphasize the fact that the Ricci tensor is symmetric. We can flip the values of alpha and beta without changing the value. Well, we then went on to define the Ricci scalar. And the Ricci scalar is simply the contraction of our Ricci tensor, or equivalently, the double contraction of the Riemann tensor. These are equivalent definitions, and they mean the same thing. Well, we know we have an invariant scalar value here, then, because any time you contract a second-rank tensor, you get an invariant scalar value. We then went on to show that the uh, Gaussian curvature, kappa here, is equal to one-half of the Ricci scalar that we've defined up here. Next, we took the time to derive an expression known as the contracted Bianchi identity, and it's this relationship right here. Now, the significance of this relationship lies in the fact that this is the divergence operator here. Since we have this contraction here with alpha, this is a divergence. So um, this expression tells us that the divergence of this factor is equal to zero.
It also tells us that the divergence of the Ricci tensor itself is not equal to zero. Well, this relationship then gave us the motivation to define yet another tensor known as the Einstein tensor. The Einstein tensor is closely related to the Ricci tensor. In fact, you can see from the definition that it's just the Ricci tensor with the addition of this extra term. And this extra term normalizes the definition. And you can see that if we were to raise all of these indexes, we'd simply get this factor. And that means that the divergence of the Einstein tensor is equal to zero. The other thing to notice is that um, since the Ricci tensor is symmetric and so is the metric tensor, then that means the Einstein tensor itself is symmetric. And that's why I've written it this way. Now, you may have already guessed from its name that the Einstein tensor is a pivotal component in the work that Einstein did with general relativity. Einstein needed a second rank tensor to represent the curvature of space-time. And the Ricci tensor was almost what he needed, but not quite. He needed something in which the divergence was equal to zero. And as it turns out, our definition of the Einstein tensor, as you see here, met that requirement perfectly. OK, for the last few videos, we've concentrated on curvature, especially as it relates to surfaces. Well, having covered that topic, we're going to shift our attention now to curves. And that's where we'll go in the next video.